morning, everybody. Good morning, computer. <laughs> <laughs> start off just from the printout of the text. So last night I gave an explanation of the refrain, the third and fourth lines that recur in each verse. So now we'll come to the content of the verses themselves. And as I explained yesterday, the 17 verses of the sutta, each will enumerate a particular either emotional defilement or cognitive distortion that has to be eliminated to attain the final goal of the Buddha's path, which is stated here as the giving up of the here and the beyond. And so the first of these defilements that's mentioned in the verses So let us read the verse together, and then I'll give the translation and the explanation. So I'll recite each line or each phrase in Pali, and you recite after me. Yo upati tang. Yo upati tang. Vineti kodang. Vineti kodang. Visa tang. Sapa visam. Visatam sapa visam. Va osadehi. Va osadehi. So biku jahati. So biku jahati. O raparam. O raparam. Urago jinamiva. Urago jinamiva. Tachang puranam. Tachang puranam. <coughs> okay, and then the translation of this, one who removes the anger that has arisen as one removes with herbs a snake's spreading venom, that monk gives up the here and the beyond as a serpent sheds its old, worn-out skin. Okay, so this verse is singling out the particular defilement that has to be eliminated is anger. And it speaks about the removal of anger. And it uses the verb vineti, which is translated removes. The word vineti is also the origin of the word vinya, which means monastic discipline. So the word vinya, which is translated as discipline, literally means the removing, the leading away of, in the case of monastic discipline, of unwholesome conduct, in the case of the mental training, the leading away or removal of unwholesome states of mind. And the commentaries explain that there are five ways of removing any particular defilement. So five kinds of vinya or removal. So the five are by sila or moral discipline, by sati, by mindfulness, by energy or effort, virya, by patience, and then by knowledge or understanding.
Okay, so how does one remove a defilement like anger by moral discipline, by sila? Okay, suppose anger arises in the mind, the natural sort of way in which we respond to that anger, if we haven't cultivated our mind, is by expressing that anger in bodily action, some kind of violent bodily action, or some kind of harmful verbal action by yelling, shouting, cursing, denigrating somebody. So those would be unwholesome expressions of anger through body and speech. And the way of removing anger to that extent by sila is that we follow particular precepts. The precept of not harming other people through physical violence, particularly not taking life or not inflicting physical violence on others. And then by controlling our speech, particularly through the principle of avoiding harsh speech. Okay, so this is how we control anger through sila, through taking up a moral training. But just observing moral principles is not enough because the anger remains in the mind. And there's that tendency for anger to arise. So the second way of dealing with anger, now we come to the more inner training, is through mindfulness. That is, one becomes mindful of one's state of mind. And so when anger arises, one recognizes anger has arisen in me. There's a, my mind is becoming angry. And then by observing and noting the anger, then one is able to control it and prevent it from gaining strength and finding opportunities to express itself either in action or in speech. And so mindfulness is that inner monitor, that inner awareness that lets us recognize our states of mind. Okay, the third method of dealing with anger actually goes hand in hand with mindfulness and that is energy or effort. That is when, through mindfulness, one recognizes anger has arisen, then through energy or effort, one makes that, or through energy, one makes that effort to overcome and to eliminate the arisen anger, or to prevent the anger that's te tending to arise from arising in the mind. This is actually mentioned as part of the Buddha's explanation, what is right effort? The effort to prevent the arising of unwholesome mental states and to abandon those unwholesome mental states that have already arisen. Okay, so this is eliminating a defilement through effort or energy. The fourth method is through patience. Through patience when other people are behaving towards oneself in disagreeable ways, in offensive ways, or when you're meeting with disturbing external conditions, could be bodily illness, or sounds of airplanes coming overhead, <laughs> or when driving, another driver who's driving in a somewhat aggressive way. So the remedy here is patience, to endure difficult conditions by bringing up patience. And there are various ways that the Buddha teaches to cultivate patience. Okay, and then the fifth way to overcome the defilement, in this case anger, is through jnana, which means knowledge or understanding. So here one understands or sees that the undesirable consequences of anger, whether it up 
obsesses the mind or comes to expression in bodily or verbal action. Now the way I've prepared for this retreat is by using each of these defilements and delusions mentioned in the text as a major heading and then collecting a number of related texts which sort of expand upon and elaborate upon that particular defilement or delusion that forms the theme of the verse. It seems last night I intended to put the computer to sleep, not to shut it off, but I must have. Okay. I must have turned it off through lack of mindfulness. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so here, I've already gone through the five ways of dealing with anger. Now we come to, can everybody see in the back? I'm having trouble. Yeah, I'm going to expand, increase the size. Yeah, I see why it's just a hundred. How about now? Much better. Okay, so this is a sutta in which the Buddha speaks about, he's comparing the nature of, of people to four kinds of vipers, vipers, a poisonous snake. And so, so we can look at this scheme that the Buddha lays out and we could reflect on ourselves and ask ourselves, where do we fit into the scheme? Okay, the one who's the viper, who's venom, comes up quickly, but it's not deadly. The one whose venom is deadly, but doesn't come up quickly. The one whose venom is both quick to come up and deadly. And the one whose venom is neither quick to come up nor deadly. So those are the four kinds of vipers. And so there are four types of persons who are similar to the vipers. And then they're described in the same way. Then the Buddha gives the explanation. So how is a person, one whose venom is quick to come up but not deadly? Okay, someone often becomes angry but his anger does not remain long within. I think we know people like that, they quickly get angry, but with a few conciliatory words, the anger subsides and they become patient and friendly again. Okay, this is the person whose venom is deadly, but not quick to come up. Here someone doesn't often become angry, but their anger remains long within them and it can turn into a kind of bitter resentment which when it finds the opportunity can create a lot of damage. Okay, the third is the person whose venom is both quick to come up, that is they often get angry and that anger remains long within them that is a very deadly type of person. Okay, and how is a person one whose venom is neither quick to come up nor deadly? Here someone does not often become angry and his anger does not remain long within him. So that would be the most desirable of these four types of persons. Actually the most desirable would be one who doesn't get angry at all. <laughs> but I want to say something about this word anger. This is the way we translate 
the word, the Pali word, koda. And this is a problem I've struggled with myself, and I think a lot of other people do. We raise the question, are there ever any circumstances on which we could say it's proper or right or justifiable to get angry? And then sort of the standard Buddhist answer to this is, no, you should be patient under all conditions, never get angry. But I take a more nuanced position, and what I say is that the English word anger can have different shades of meaning or different aspects, which so that they, it doesn't exactly correspond to the Pali word koda or its synonyms. So what I would say is that the kind of anger that obsesses and overcomes the mind so that one loses control and is motivated to act in even violent ways and harsh or aggressive ways, the kind of anger which takes control of you so that you're not in control of your own mind anymore. That is the kind of anger that's meant by the Pali word koda and that has to be eliminated. But I would say that there is a kind of, I'll use the word in quotation box, righteous anger, or I prefer moral indignation, or even moral outrage, which is when one encounters situations which are unjust, which are destructive, violent, harmful to people, to society. Like just this past week, I mean, when I was seeing the news reports on what the senators were doing, trying to push through what they call their health care plan that's going to knock some 20 million people off health care, or when we hear about police shooting African-American people and then getting off without any punishment, or chemical corporations releasing toxic chemicals into the water supply. I mean, I'm not going to sit there and say, I'm going to remain patient with this. <laughs> but my feeling is that we can use a certain moral, inner moral force as a motivation for standing up for what seems to be unjust, harmful, and destructive, but we control the <coughs> anger so that the anger doesn't get possession of our mind. So we're able to use that the initial swelling up of, let's say, res resistant, or the swelling up of opposition to these policies, these actions, these programs, that swelling up of an attitude of opposition to motivate us to resist and to take remedial action or transformative action. But we still don't let our mind be overthrown by that feeling of opposition. So we have a kind of controlled, through mindfulness, a controlled opposition motivated by what I would call moral passion, a passion for what is right, just, beneficial to people, society, the world. Okay, so I, make, I find it important to make that distinction when we face so many critical social, economic, political challenges today. So I'm not saying that we should just form into a, a, fall back into a state of dull, quiescent acceptance of whatever <laughs> our political leaders or our other people in positions of power want to impose on us. Okay, here is a text that speaks about some of the disadvantages or drawbacks in anger. So when we use, we could use these as re themes for reflection to see the importance of being able to overcome anger. So when a person often becomes angry, their features become ugly. Because if you see an angry person, oh, I had it on my other computer. <laughs> Um, yeah, if you, even if you go into Google Images and you put in anger 
or angry face, you see some faces of people who are angry, and you see that they're very disagreeable expression in the face. So one feels a kind of repulsion just to look at those that face. Okay, so a person who becomes angry, they sleep badly, they can't fulfill their aims because when they're when overcome by anger, they'll even defeat their own purposes. <laughs> they do not gain wealth. Actually, I think a, a lot of very angry people do manage somehow to get it. <laughs> they do not gain fame. Not quite true. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to <laughs> have to raise objections to statements of the Buddha, but there are too many angry people who have gotten into a lot of wealth and become very famous. <laughs> um, they do not win friends. Well, on an ordinary level, let's say, <laughs> an angry person will deter a lot of people from making friends with them. But if you're you have that kind of quiet, venomous anger, and you become rich and famous. At a superficial level, you can, you can make a lot of friends, <laughs> but they are just temporary friends, and if they turn against you, or they recuse themselves from... <laughs> <laughs> or they threaten to investigate you, <laughs> then that friendship will be very short-lived. <laughs> okay, and then anger is a factor that generates unwholesome karma, particularly when it becomes habitual and when it explodes in violent, destructive action, bodily action, or pernicious speech, then it creates unwholesome karma. And if that karma becomes potent enough and sort of stored up with a lot of repetition in the stream of consciousness, then with the breakup of the body after death, if that karma takes on the role of generating rebirth, it will bring rebirth into one of the bad destinations even the lowest, the realm of hell. Okay, when anger becomes persistent and habitual, it turns into what we call ill will or resentment. And here I took a text which explains five ways of removing ill will when it arises to, any, to anybody. So the first way is to develop loving-kindness towards that person towards whom ill will has arisen. So loving-kindness is the wish for the welfare and happiness of others. And so usually we don't begin immediately with the person towards whom we have ill will, but one begins developing loving-kindness as a meditation practice. First towards oneself, seeing that I want to be well and happy, free from harm. Then one chooses people who are one's friends or close relatives, wishing may they be well and happy. Then one can move to mere acquaintances like neighbors, colleagues at work, may they be well and happy. Then to relative strangers, people one just might pass on the street, may they be well and happy. And so then when one builds up kind of force or momentum of goodwill or loving kindness towards people, then one can direct it towards the hostile or aggressive person, wishing that they might be well and happy. So this is using loving kindness to overcome ill will. The next is to develop compassion towards that person, particularly if you see that person is doing things that are destructive and harmful to others, then we know that that person is also at the same time destroying their own future well-being. And so 
recognizing that this per or even that this person, if they're acting aggressively towards you or towards others, they're doing this because there's generally some kind of suffering within themselves which is gnawing away, eating away at their own mind, and they can't deal with that suffering. So their way of trying to deal with it is to project it outwards onto others. And so if one understands that that person is really undergoing a lot of inner misery, then one will feel compassion towards that person. A third way is to develop equanimity towards that person. That is, one, even though the person acts aggressively towards you, speaks rudely to you, you just let it come in one ear and go out the other ear. And just not be upset by the way that person is behaving. And then the fourth way, which actually seems very similar to developing equanimity, is just to ignore that person and don't pay any attention to them. Like you might have tried speaking to that person, not, it's not saying that the first thing you do is to ignore the person. Maybe you've tried to establish some reconciliation with that person, to speak to the person, to establish friendly relations with them. Mm -hmm. All of that fails and all you could do is not pay attention to that person anymore when they act provocatively. And then the fifth way is to apply the idea of the ownership of karma in relation to that person. So this means that one reflects that this person is acting rude, harmful, aggressive ways, that we all are ultimately responsible for our own karma, the karma that we create through our own actions. And so this person is behaving rudely towards me, I maintain equanimity towards that person and I reflect that person will have to deal with their karma. If I remain patient, then I am creating for myself wholesome karma. So that person will have to face their own, the consequences of their own deeds, their own behavior. Okay, so these are five ways of removing anger. This occurs in one sutta in the Ankutara Nikaya, Book of Fives, number 161. <laughs> the following sutta, number 162, mentions five other ways of dealing with anger, which I won't go into here. Okay, next comes a sutta in which the Buddha speaks, he's speaking to the monks, and he speaks about how to patiently endure abusive speech. So he says that there are these five ways in which others may speak to you. Their speech may be timely or untimely. They might speak to you at the right time, which is okay, or at the wrong time. The wrong time, say you're with your friends, and then somebody comes over to you and says, you know, you didn't clean up the kitchen. You were supposed to clean up the kitchen, but you just came over and started talking to your friends. Well, everybody else is doing work, you're not doing work. So if you speak to, like that to somebody, it embarrasses them in the presence of their friends. So if you're going to speak to somebody, you find the right time, like when they're alone, when they're not engaged in some other activity. Okay, the speech may be true or false, like somebody might criticize you for what you actually did, or somebody might criticize you for something you didn't do, so they're putting blame on you falsely. They might speak gently or harshly. They might speak with good intention or with harmful intention. They might speak with loving kindness or with a mind of hate. So what the Buddha's advice to the monks, he says, this is the way you should train yourselves that under all of these conditions, our minds will remain unaffected and we won't respond by speaking with angry words, but we shall remain compassionate for the well-being of that person who's speaking in such a way, with a mind of loving-kindness, without inner hate. 
that as sort of the first stage is to remain with an unruffled mind, then coming to the next stage, one pervades that person with a mind of loving kindness. One wishes for the well-being and happiness of that person. And then starting with that person, then one extends that loving kindness outwards over wider and wider areas until one pervades the entire world with a mind of loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. Okay, this is another sutta on how loving-kindness is the antidote to ill-will. Okay, so here a monk might say, <laughs> I have developed and cultivated the liberation of the mind by loving-kindness, made it my vehicle and foundation, I, I firmly established it, and so forth, yet ill-will or anger still takes control of my mind. Okay, here the text is speaking about the liberation of the mind by loving-kindness, not just the practice of loving-kindness meditation, but this is developing the loving-kindness meditation to the point where it actually amounts to a meditative absorption, where the mind is completely absorbed in this all-embracing, <coughs> all-expansive, immeasurable loving-kindness. And yet, the person who says he's developing this also says, ill will still takes control of my mind. So this person should be told, not so. <laughs> you shouldn't speak thus, you shouldn't misrepresent the Buddha, because the Buddha would not speak in such a way. It is impossible that one might develop and cultivate the liberation of the mind by loving-kindness, yet ill-will could st still take control of one's mind. For this is the escape or the outlet from ill-will, that is the liberation of the mind by loving-kindness. Okay, then I took a sutta in which the Buddha praises with various beautiful similes the liberation of the mind by loving-kindness. And here he says that whatever kinds of worldly or mundane merit there are, all are not worth one-sixteenth part of the liberation of mind by loving-kindness. In shining and beaming and radiance, the mind... In shining and beaming and radiance, the mind's liberation by loving-kindness far excels them. And we have to note that the Buddha here is speaking about what's called worldly or mundane merit. Because beyond the mind's liberation by loving-kindness is the liberation of the mind by wisdom but that is the super-mundane or world-transcending liberation. Okay, then the Buddha says, whatever light there is of the stars, all don't amount to one-sixteenth part of the light of the moon. The moon's light far excels the light of the other stars. Okay, and then just in the last month of the rains, when the skies are clear, the sun sh drives all darkness from the sky, and shines and beams and radiates. And then when the night is turning to dawn, the morning star, or Venus, shines and beams and radiates. So whatever kinds of worldly merit there are, all are not worth one-sixteenth part of the mind's liberation by loving-kindness. Okay, so that takes us through the first verse, which is the removal of anger. And at this point, maybe we could take some questions, if anybody has questions on anything that's come up. Yes, please. Uh, I want to, uh, yeah, his name yeah. is David. 
David. Yes. Okay. So I have a question about the moral indignation. Yeah. How can you avoid slipping from moral indignation to anger? Yeah. And then from anger to a kind of soft depression because you feel impotent. To a kind of uh, <coughs> soft depression. Soft depression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you feel you cannot do anything. Yeah. And that just liking you on on Facebook <laughs> yeah. will not change <laughs> the rules. Yeah. So, so <laughs> how, how can you avoid this kind of slippery? Uh, yeah. From moral indignation to yeah. anger yeah. to feeling impotent to change anything. Yeah, yeah. I would say that this is where the mental training comes in, the meditative training, particularly the mindfulness. So with mindfulness, I would say, and also its counterpart, clear comprehension. So with clear comprehension, one could see the subtle distinction between what I call the moral indignation and the, I call it the tumultuous anger. So one could see the distinction between them, and one can know, or through mind, through that one can know the distinction, and then through mindfulness, one could be aware if the mind is tending to slip from that moral indignation into a kind of tumultuous anger. And then with right effort, one could bring the mind back and recognizing the dangers in anger. In fact, if I really become angry, I'm just going to defeat my purposes, and if I don't get what I want, if I don't sort of push through the kinds of programs or policies that I want, say on the political scene, then I'm going to get upset, and if I get upset, then I might even turn violent, or if I hold my anger inside, then I become depressed, and dejected and feel impotent. Okay, so it's in this way, I would say, through clearly comprehending the distinction when they arise within oneself, then with mindfulness and right effort, one sort of turns the anger that's arising, turns it around, or transforms it into moral indignation. And then from that standpoint of moral indignation, then calmly, and with self-collected, one could choose what one takes to be the most effective line of action and act upon it. They hold. they hold a lot of like stuff internally and yeah. they project that pain and stuff in onto themselves. Yeah. And you know they become super depressed and then yeah. when there are low flying planes then I have difficulty hearing. Okay. okay. And then they become very depressed and you know sometimes they feel more like really like kind of dark negative thoughts yeah. or yeah. suicidal tendencies. Because in the sutta it says like when you hold anger, um, it's like you are actually it's two ways, right? You're kind of doing harm to others and also harm on yourself. Yeah. But in this case, I don't like what is the harm to other people that they are doing since they're kind of like holding it internally. If somebody is like holding that anger internally, and then it leads to a state of depression. That would be harming themselves, not not, not directly harming other people. Uh -huh. Because in the sutta, it didn't say that you hold anger. It's like it's there's like a almost like a one to one mapping. It's like to others and to yourself. In in one of the texts that I included here. The, the seven disadvantages of anger. 
the features become ugly, one sleeps badly, one does not fulfill one's purposes, one does not gain wealth, does not gain fame. Yeah, I didn't say that. Yeah. Oh, but general, generally what I would say though, in the normal case when ill will arises, or anger, hostility, it's harmful to oneself because you lose control of your own mind and also even physiologically it causes, could cause heart problems, strokes, other conditions come from high blood pressure and so on. And then that kind of be mental state will lead to aggressive or violent behavior or destructive behavior towards others, so it's harmful to both. Yeah, yeah but if a person say, doesn't express the anger but doesn't know how to deal with it skillfully at the psychological level, then it can turn into a state of inner morbidity and perhaps even turn into clinical depression. In that case, one has to know how to deal with the anger so that it doesn't, one doesn't turn it inward upon oneself. So in this case, would you say like anger is like, you can either project it onto someone, become very destructive to the things that, and people around you, or you can kind of inflect it just like upon yourself? Yeah, either way is, so it's harmful. <laughs> so the way, the ideal way for Buddhism to deal with the anger is by you know, using skillful methods to overcome it in the mind, mm -hmm. any of the various methods that the Buddha teaches. Mm -hmm. I think, Alvin, do you? Um, with regard to the fifth harm, I don't know the, I'm, I don't know Pali, is there a distinction between fame and infamy? Yeah, there is a distinction. So fame is considered a desirable goal. It's not that one becomes <laughs> infamous, notorious. <laughs> yeah, Virginia. Um, I, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I always had confusion during that um, conflict between the Buddha and Devadatta when Devadatta tried to take over the Sangha, yeah. and the Buddha got really angry at him and said all of those mean things. But uh, I don't know if you remember. <laughs> Of course you do. That was yeah. um, so, um, I always thought that might be a sign that he wasn't fully completely liberated, but I'm wondering, is that an example of the moral indignation that you're speaking of? It must be. Maybe for those who don't know the, the background story, Devadatta was the Buddha's cousin, and he, he was very ambitious and he wanted to take over control of the Sangha, and the Buddha was getting old. So one day, Devadatta came to the Buddha and said, Bhante, you are getting old, and it's troublesome for you to have to guide the Sangha, so why don't you take early retirement, <laughs> and I will take over the Sangha. And then the Buddha spoke, I have to say, it does seem rather nasty words, he said. What was the expression? You lick spittle? Yeah, right. You lick spittle. I wouldn't... I don't remember the exact um, expression that he used, but I wouldn't turn, I will never turn the Sangha over to somebody like you. And then because of that, Devadatta then developed this resentment to the Buddha and tried to harm the Buddha. So. I mean, what I would have to say is that the Buddha doesn't have anger. And I have to say, frankly, I've been troubled by the, that passage myself. I don't want to try to justify it, because in my opinion, <laughs> the Buddha's reply, as it comes down in the text, could have been more polite, more conciliatory. But I have a suspicion that that passage perhaps was the work of the compilers of the canon <laughs> who developed, you know, to have a hero you also have to have a villain. And so they had to create or depict, turn Devadatta into the villain of the drama, dramatic story of the Buddha. So, I mean, I take on trust that the Buddha has eradicated all of the mind's defilements, including anger and ill will. So maybe we'll take 
have one more question, then we'll have to move on. Um, I just wanted a clarification, please. Um, one in the last episode of the Sutta, when you were talking about liberation of the mind by loving kindness, yeah. is it liberation in terms of freedom from anger or like liberation in terms of nirvana? Because I was under the impression that one could not yeah. attain nirvana only by through the means of loving kindness. Yeah, yeah. It's not the ultimate or final liberation. It's not the attainment of Nibbana, but it means the... <clears throat> let's say it means the development of loving-kindness as a meditation subject to the point of, that corresponds to the attainment of the jhanas. Or you could say it's the development of the jhanas through loving-kindness as the meditation method that one is using. So it's a temporary liberation in which the mind is cleared not only of anger but of all of the defilements, but it's only cleared of the defilements in their active forms. It's not the elimination or the eradication of defilements. Thank you. Okay, we could take one more question now. Um, when you talk about the story about Devadatta, you know, Devadatta has been a thorn in Buddha's side for his whole life. I, I always interpret that maybe because I'm so concerned with one of the first stories about Devadatta where he shoots a crane and the crane yeah. is rescued by Buddha. They're yeah. 14, right? So this is a very early story yeah. where um, he shoots the crane and Buddha rescues the crane and then goes in front of the judges who all say, yeah, yeah. right, life belongs to those who seek to preserve it right, rather yeah. than those who seek to destroy it. So it's, to me, it seems that he's, uh, maybe the translators are making this as a kind of, he's a human being. You know, he's yeah. had a long lifetime of having. <laughs> and so maybe in a way it is justified. And it's, and it's, you know, yeah. as you talk about moral indignation, yeah. which I'm yeah. very, very interested in how we transform that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, with climate change and all those issues. I, I like to think that, that, you know, there is a certain amount of, you have to accept the anger, and then you work through it with loving kindness, but you don't reject it. You, you can't, yeah. you yeah. can't yeah. reject it and yeah. get to moral indignation with any kind of clarity. Yeah, you can't project it onto others. You right, you yeah. can't, or you can't it onto project others, it yeah. on other people, and yeah. you can't reject the anger. You have yeah. to, yeah. It, you have to, um, yeah. uh, as you say, transform yeah. it in a way yeah. into yeah. moral indignation. Yeah. And he's a human, yeah. he yeah. is a human, yeah. he is not a god, yeah. Yeah, which I love. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we have to move on now, because I want to move to the next verse. Okay, the next verse, deals with the cutting off of lust. So first let's read a verse in the Pali. Yo ragam udachita asesam. Yo ragam udachita asesam. Bisa pubhanga Saro Ruham Vigaiha. Saro Ruham Vigaiha. So Biku Jahati Ora Param. So Biku Jahati Ora Param. Ura Go Jinamiva. Ura Go Jinamiva. Tachang Purana. Okay, so the key word in this verse, the Pali word, is raga, which I translate as lust. And raga is almost a synonym of tanha, which is what we usually translate as craving. A craving will be mentioned separately in the next verse. So. Generally, when raga stands alone, we can see it as specifically a specific type of attachment or desire, which is 
the fuller Pali expression is kama raga, which is sensual lust. And so this brings up a rather sensitive theme where I have to say some things about the Buddhist attitude towards sexuality. Now, Buddhism doesn't regard sexuality as being inherently evil or sinful in any way, but the sexual desire is seen as one of the manifestations or forms of craving. And so sensual desire arises through each of the senses, the eye through the eye for beautiful forms, the ear through for beautiful sounds, <laughs> through the nose through delightful odors, the tongue for taste, the body through pleasant tactile sensations. And then the strongest manifestation of that sensual desire or sensual lust is sexuality. And so since sexual desire is a manifestation of craving, and craving, the Buddha teaches, is the cause or origin of suffering. And so to gain liberation, to gain, attain Nibbana, ultimately one has to eliminate craving and this very strong, clear, concrete manifestation of craving is sensual desire, specifically sexual desire. And so the Buddha established when he established the monastic order, one of the guiding principles is celibacy, that monks and nuns have to observe the precept of abstaining from sexual activity and any transgressions into beyond, into overt sexual activity entails certain penalties, the most serious entailing expulsion from the monastic order. And the Buddha ordained, I mean, many of his disciples who became monks and nuns were young, relatively young people, you know, novices in their teens, ordained monks and nuns in their early 20s. So they come into the order with ordained. It doesn't turn them immediately into liberated arhats just by taking ordination. And the main problem that many monastics have to deal with is the arising of sexual desire, sexual fantasies, thoughts, cravings, imaginings come up. And so one has to use the skillful means for gradually wearing away that sensual desire until when the insight becomes strong enough that it will cut it off entirely. And so here the Buddha speaks about the cutting off of lust, he compares it to plucking a lotus growing in a lake. And you think of a lotus flower as something beautiful. How do I get rid of this? Thing? Uh, what if you click on your document? It, maybe it'll go away by itself. Okay, so we think of the lotus flower as being something which is beautiful, with a nice fragrance. In a way, it <laughs> represents the objects of sensual desire, and yet the response to this is to pluck out that lotus growing in the lake. Okay, so let us see what the texts tell us. Okay, so here the Buddha is speaking to a Brahmin and he's telling the Brahmin, explaining to the Brahmin what is called the dangers or drawbacks in sensual lust. So he says, when's what, when one's mind is obsessed by sensual lust, overwhelmed by sensual lust, and one doesn't understand the escape or the release from sensual lust, then one does not really know one's own good or the good of others or the good of both. And then he compares this to a bowl of water that's mixed with different colored dyes. Turmeric is kind of yellow, blue dye, I don't know, lac. I think it's a purple, blue dye, crimson dye. So if a man with good sight were to look at his facial reflection in it, he would not see it as it really is. And so it is, he says, when one's mind is obsessed by sensual lust.
And then the Buddha speaks about sensual lust as a shackle in the heart. So he says that when a monk is not free, is temporarily free from lust for sensual pleasures, then his mind does not incline to utter devotion, perseverance, and striving. That's the striving in the practice. So that is a shackle in the heart. Similarly, when the monk is not free from lust for form, for visible form. Okay, and this is a very powerful passage that explains the drawback in sensuality. And this actually indicates, I would say, the way sensual desire functions. Like sensual desire, when it arises, it creates this compelling drive within the mind that I have to obtain the object of sensual desire. Let me use a rather innocent example. I have the craving for chocolate ice cream. <laughs> okay, so I'm sitting here, and then out of nowhere, the, suddenly the desire for a dish of chocolate ice cream arises in the mind, and it becomes compelling, 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 till before I know it, I'm putting on my sandals, <laughs> <laughs> closing down my computer, and heading down the road. And, Yesterday, when I took a walk, I passed an ice cream shop. <laughs> or maybe I asked somebody with a car to drive me to the Baskin Robbins. <laughs> and I think, that's going to satisfy me. <laughs> and so we go get the ice cream, chocolate ice cream, I eat it, I'm enjoying it. Okay, now I'm happy, but then next day, same time, that desire comes up again. Now, because I yielded to the desire, it's even more forceful. And so, all of our desires are forms of like subtle addictions. Maybe we could see actually the way desire works most um, poignantly in the case of addiction. Addiction to, well, people are addicted to foods, just to the act of eating not to speak about the flavors of the foods, and then even to drugs. So it becomes a compulsion. So here the Buddha uses the example of a leper with sores and blisters on his limbs. It's being devoured by worms, scratching the scabs off his wounds with his nails, and he's cauterizing his body over a burning charcoal pit. This must have been something that was done in India at that time by people with, this, with leprosy or perhaps with some other skin disease. Okay, then his friends and relatives bring a physician to treat him. The physician makes medicine and then cures that man of his leprosy. And so the man becomes well and happy and he's able to go about. Now he's free from that disease. Okay. But previously, he was getting the pleasure from the charcoal pit. But now two strong men seize him by both arms and drag him towards the burning charcoal pit where he used to get pleasure. So then the Buddha asks this Magandhi, he says, what do you think? Would that man twist his body this way and that? And Magandhi says, yes. Why is that? Because that fire is actually, it's painful to the touch. It's hot and scorching. Then the Buddha says, what do you think? Is it only now, now that the man is cured, that the fire is painful to touch? Or was it also painful to touch previously when the man had the skin disease? And then Magandhi says, if the fire is now painful to touch, hot and scorching, and previously too the fire was painful to touch, hot and scorching. For when that man was a leper with the sores and blisters on his limbs and so forth, scratching the scabs off his wounds, his faculties were impaired. That is the 
disease caused his sense of touch to be impaired. So even though the fire was actually painful to touch, he acquired a mistaken perception of it as being pleasant. And so the Buddha says, in the past, sensual pleasures were painful to touch, hot and scorching. In the future, sensual pleasures will be painful to touch, hot and scorching. And now at present, sensual pleasures are painful to touch, hot and scorching. So, from the Buddha's standpoint, as one who has reached this liberation of the mind, so he could look back, in fact, he, when he was a prince living in the palace, he could experience the wide variety of sensual pleasures in great abundance. So he's not speaking just from the position of an ascetic who's completely, always been completely removed from the world. But he says that those people who are not free from lust for sensual pleasures, who are devoured by craving for sensual pleasures, who burn with craving for, for, with the fever for sensual pleasures, have faculties that are impaired. That is, our wisdom faculty is impaired so that we don't have sufficient insight or wisdom to understand the real nature of sensual pleasures. And so even those sensual pleasures, when you look at them you know, deeply and reflect upon them clearly and closely, one sees that they're actually painful to the touch. But because our faculties are impaired, we acquire a mistaken perception of them as pleasant. So actually, beautiful and delightful sensual objects, when we indulge them, they'll actually create or give rise to pleasant feelings. It's not that they give rise to painful feelings. But those pleasant feelings cause a kind of disturbance of the mind, an agitation of the mind, that the mind is never quiet, restful, and at peace unless it's gobbling up sensual pleasures. And it's the nature of sensual desire, sort of in principle, to be insatiable, that it can never really be satisfied and settle down. What takes place, like when I indulge myself in that dish of chocolate ice cream, is just a temporary gratification. But that gratification will, in time, wear off. You know, I come down to the last spoon of chocolate ice cream, and then I have to sort of break that last spoon up into quarter spoons to make it last. <laughs> then when I finish, I think, well, that was great. <laughs> but then, you know, before long, even though it might take another day before the craving for chocolate ice cream to arise again, but I need something else to fill that desire for sensual pleasure. So what should I do now? What can I do now? So it becomes a endless drive, a scratching of the mind, a compulsion of the mind, why I'm always driving me out to find one beautiful sensual object, one delightful sensual object after another. And you can see that like, this is actually the way our consumerist society functions. So people are always being bombarded by advertisements. You need this to be happy, you need that to be happy. You have to gain this, have to gain that. And buy this, buy that, enjoy this, enjoy that. But there's never a sense of this is enough. Okay, this is a passage. I had some second thoughts about including this, since if we look at it today, we say, okay, this might be sexist. <laughs> but I think I have to take the text and present them, even though they might not be so 
in accordance with contemporary attitudes. <laughs> and here we have to remember the Buddha is speaking to the monks, and so perhaps this is an assembly of young monks who have a strong disposition towards sensual desire, attraction to the young girls that they see. They go out belly on their alms round, and so when you're going on alms round to house to house, I don't know if any of you have <laughs> ever done this. Maybe Bhante Sudasso has, yeah. <laughs> but you've done it in America. It's different in Asia. Maybe you were in Asia, I don't know. In Asia, the ones who come out from the house to walk with the alms, it's al almost always the women, and it will be maybe like the woman of the house, but she'll come out with her daughters, could be like girls, 15, 16 years old, and you're <coughs> a young monk, say 22, 23 years old, you're on your alms round, and then you have to look up to receive the food and recite a little blessing and the eyes meet and electricity <laughs> has a <laughs> And so then you go back to the monastery and you think, I can't wait to go out. <laughs> Day, you're looking at your clock. Maybe you go out at nine o'clock on arms round. It's eight o'clock. <laughs> clock is going to. Clock is moving so so slow. <laughs> it's quarter to nine. <laughs> then the abbot says, comes around. And he says, Body, you're not going on arms round. <laughs> I'm sending Radha out on the arms round. <laughs> so you, you, you have the whole morning to yourself. You should do. You could do your study, your meditation. No, I want to go on arms round. <laughs> I will gladly give the opportunity to Ratha to stay by. <laughs> okay, so here the Buddha is using the example of a lovely girl in her 15th or 16th year when her beauty is at her peak. So this is the way one begins this contemplation. Okay, then one might see the same woman at the age of 80, 90, or 100, decrepit, bent over, doubled over, leaning on a stick, her youth gone, the teeth are broken, the hair is gray, and so forth, wrinkled with blotchy limbs. What do you think? Has her former beauty vanished and the danger become evident? Yes, Fante. So, <laughs> hear that? No. <laughs> Be happy you're not on arms round today. <laughs> so monks, this is a danger in the case of form. So this is old age, then comes illness. One might see that same woman gravely ill, lying in her own urine and feces, moved around by others. Again, the beauty has vanished and the danger has become evident or the drawback. Okay, then again, one might see that same woman, this is sort of to be done as a contemplation or reflection, as a corpse thrown aside in the charnel ground, bloated, livid, oozing matter. Again, has her former beauty vanished and the danger become evident? Yes, Bhante. So this too is a danger in the case of form. And then it takes that same process of decay through the successive stages until it's reduced to a skeleton, and then it continues where the bones have been separated and the bones are decaying. So has her former beauty vanished and the danger become evident? So this too is a danger in the case of form. Okay, so these passages bring out the drawback or danger in sensual lust 
And now come some suttas on how to extinguish lust. So, the main method is the perception of the unattractive. Actually, I should have taken that before coming to that passage, so let me jump down. Yeah, there's a particular meditative object or meditative method which is used to allay <coughs> or to um, overcome and to remove sensual lust. And that method is called the Asuba Sanya, which could be translated the perception of unattractiveness, the perception of the unattractive. And that is the meditation on the parts of the body. And it's always advised that one do this initially, in fact for a long time, with one's own body, rather than taking the body of another person, which you might choose the person that you're attracted to. And so if we have the young monk on arms round, uh, who, the young monk who has been going on arms round, and he takes as his object the figure of that young girl that he's attracted to, he won't, though he starts off <laughs> following the formula, he'll be, before long he'll be dropping off the parts of the body mentioned in the text and then focusing on the nice gleam in the eyes, the beautiful smile, the nice figure, and so forth. And so one takes one's own body and then develops this perception of the unattractiveness of bodily form based on the parts of the body. So we find this passage is included in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Discourse on the Foundations of Mindfulness, and in a number of other suttas. Here I've taken it from the Anguttara Nikaya, where the Buddha is speaking to Ananda, so he explains the method that you review your own body from the soles of the feet going upward, from the tips of the hairs going downward, enclosed in skin, as full of many impurities or unattractive parts. So there are in this body head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh or the muscles, sinews, bones, the bone marrow, then the organs, the kidneys, heart, liver, the pleura or membranes, the spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery. Mesentery is a kind of tissue. Any medical people here? Okay. The mesentery is a tissue that binds the intestines. Binds the intestines to what? Yeah. It binds the intestines. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then later texts add another part here that doesn't come in the oldest canonical text to fill out 32 parts. This is the brain. I'm, so, I'm sorry, not here. Okay, mesentery, stomach, feces, then comes brain. <laughs> no, it's not in order of it. It's, not kind of it's just that <laughs> just that these these are all taken to be the solid parts of the body, and so the brain was added at the end by later text, so it's put at the end. Then come the liquid parts, bile, which is produced by the liver and stored in the gallbladder, the phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, saliva, snot, the fluid of the joints, and urine. So altogether we have like 32 parts here, and the way it's done is to 
go through the 32 parts, usually broken it down into groups, and one goes back and forth through each group. If you like, we could do this in the afternoon, if you're interested. Yeah, maybe we'll, we'll do it. Just. Okay, so as one practices this over time, the, the objective, I have to say, is not to cultivate a sense of revulsion towards one's own body, or a kind of sense of the self-loathing towards the body, but the ideal is to develop a kind of, what I call a withering away of sensual desire. And this is done by you starting with one's own body in order to get a clear perception of the inner nature of the body, or even the external parts of the body when you look at them closely. When you take, instead of looking at the hairs as a mass, you just take like a few head hairs and look at them individually, and not very beautiful and attractive. And then you take <laughs> you know, the teeth, the girl has a nice beautiful smile, or the man has a nice beautiful smile. You see the teeth, the teeth flashing, but if you extract the teeth and you put them down on a, <laughs> on a slab and you look at them, you're not so lovely. And then the skin, you know, such beautiful smooth skin, but if you take from a, a medical textbook where they show blow-ups of the skin, the different layers of the skin, with the fatty layer, and then the hair pores. Just not so beautiful. Okay, so in this way, one develops this perception of the unattractive. Okay, now it becomes more meaningful to go to this passage. So here it said, when a monk often cultivates the perception of, of the unattractive, his mind shrinks away from sexual enjoyment, turns back from it, rolls away from it, and is not drawn towards it. And then either equanimity or distaste towards it is established in him. And then the text uses a simile. It's just like a feather or a strip of sinew, if thrown into a fire, that feather or strip of sinew will shrink away from the fire and sort of roll back, and it won't be drawn towards the fire. And so it is with a monk who often cultivates this perception of the unattractive. Okay, then there's a specific case of a monk named Vangisa, who was a very elegant or eloquent poet. He was like the Buddha appointed him the chief poet in the Sangha. And probably because he had this skill for poetry, so his mind easily flooded with beautiful imagery. And so when they went, he went with Ananda. Ananda brought him to go to the palace because Ananda was assigned to give a sermon in the, in the harem at the palace and he took Vangisa along as his attendant. And then when they came out from this gathering, Vangisa declared that he was discontent with the monk's life and wanted to disrobe because lust had overcome his mind. So then he addresses Ananda in verse, and he says, I'm burning with sensual lust. My mind is engulfed by fire. Please tell me how to extinguish it out of compassion. And then Ananda replies, It is through an inversion of perception. This means that that which is, when you look closely, carefully, in, in depth at the body, which is taken to be beautiful, you see that it's just really a composite of these unattractive parts. So that's when you're perceiving it accurately. But when you just grasp upon the superficial impression of the body, then one perceives it as attractive or beautiful. 
So it is through an inversion of perception that your mind is engulfed by fire. Turn away from the sign of beauty, the appearance, the deceptive appearance of beauty, which is provocative of sensual lust. Then develop the mind or develop your meditation on the unattractive. One-pointed, well-concentrated, apply your mindfulness to the body and become disenchanted with the body. So this is the meditation to overcome temporarily sensual lust. But then Ananda goes into the next step, which is the way to develop the insight which will actually cut off permanently and irreversibly sensual lust. And that is by the insight into the three characteristics here stated to be C formations, that is the five aggregates, as alien, as dukkha, is bound up with suffering, not as self. Extinguish the great fire of lust don't burn up again and again. Okay, so that takes us through our exposition of the second verse. And again, now I'll sort of open up the floor to questions. So, and please, again, say your name. I'm Ian. Ian, yeah. Yeah, um, and I sometimes practice the... Uh, Contemplation of the 32 parts of the body. Yeah, yeah. I don't do all 32, yeah. but I do the ones that I can. Yeah, and yeah actually, I'll, I'll just comment on that. I find that actually to be a, a good approach to that subject. Um, initially, I think it's good to go through the 32 parts, but certain parts will stand out more distinctly than others. Others you have to sort of like consult a medical textbook <laughs> even to get some <laughs> idea what they are. But please go on. Um, and I wonder if that also might be connected to that. I mean, you mentioned that we didn't, it wasn't about cultivating our vulsion to the body. Yeah. But I do, as I've done the practice more, notice kind of a, a pleasant feeling yeah. in saying, oh, look at my stomach. It's such a nice stomach. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a little bit strange, but I do notice this yeah. developing, yeah. and I wonder what you thought about it. <laughs> my feeling is that one should have a certain respect for the body <laughs> And also, what strikes me, like, sort of the other side to the meditation on the unattractive is the reflection that the body on its own, maybe this is a little un-Buddhistic, but it's remarkable when it does all of these things on its own. Like, I don't have to give it any instructions, digest your breakfast. <laughs> I don't have to oversee it. Um, you know, from moment to moment, checking how is the digestion doing. Um, I don't have to ask my heart, with a very hard working organ, you know, it's working, it's incredible that it's working every minute or every second of every day, you know, for year after year. <laughs> Unlike a car, I don't have, or even a computer, I don't have to well, I do go to the doctor for an annual checkup, but I don't have to leave the heart of the doctor <laughs> for a few days for him to you know, pump it up and return it to me. Yeah, so there is that side to the body. But also, one could also reflect that even though the body performs all of these wonderful things on its own, but also it can, the organs also can cause a lot of trouble on their own. You know, there's indigestion, and then <coughs> cancers take root and or malfunctions of different organs which cause many different illnesses and then cancers take root in different organs so there is that side of the body as well okay Bhante, Bhante uh, my preceptor recommends using the meditation on the four elements as a way of yeah. overcoming lust yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any comments on that have you come across that before I think it can be used as well. 
it, it approaches from a different angle. So instead of like, cultivating the perception of unattractiveness in regard to the body, using the four elements helps to cultivate more the perception of maybe what we call the impersonal nature of the body, or the way the body is, because the four elements are also external, so the way that there's this continuity, continuum between the body that I take to be I and mine, and the outer world. Okay, El Ella or Ella? Uh, Ella, okay. Um. Raga? Raga? Is it related to the like, term in Sanskrit, Rajistic? Like, uh, I think you have to speak to something. Rajistic, it's like in yoga, there's this term in Sanskrit called Rajistic, which is like referring to something which is oh, energizing or oh, energizing. Ra okay, Rajas, Rajasic. Yeah, Rajistic. Is it like related? It's a different word. Okay. It's a different, I, I think it's a different word. It might actually be related to raga. I'm wondering because uh, my understanding of that term is that it's referring to things which are energizing or arousing, but also can be in a negative way. Like it can be like you can do pranayama or certain breath exercises are energizing and positively rajistic, but then there's also like rajistic foods like onion or garlic, which are right, that excites you. Yeah. yeah, which are making uh, you crave more, yeah. like have like arouse a sort of lust. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, so it might they might be connected. They might be connected. I would have to look into the word rajasic. But this word raga, you mentioned that Sanskrit or Indian culture. It's if you know the classic Indian classical music, the classical a piece in classical music is called raga. Like a, a numerous ragas according to different times of day. It's the same word. And the original sense of raga, I think, was dye. Not dye in the sense of death, but the dye that one used to color, to color clothes. So a dye gives a particular color to a piece of cloth. So the cloth can become blue, yellow, red, purple, according to the dye that one uses. And so the piece of music in the Indian classical system has a particular color which is the mood conveyed by that piece of music. Like each raga is supposed to represent and to in, engender in the listeners a particular mood. And so what we call lust is represented by raga because when lust arises it colors the mind and then the removal of lust is called viraga. V is a negative prefix. The removal of raga, lust, because it's like removing the color from the cloth, in this case, the cloth of the mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, Wendy. given by Buddha, obviously he's a very wise man too. It's more like a culture and a context of that time. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And I feel like the, when we sometimes, like especially in Mahayana, when they translate it, in, in, becomes, in what? In like the Mahayana tradition, yeah. when they translate it, it becomes super, super rigid, like, and super, almost like a suppressive, like a way of like... In the Mahayana tradition. I mean, I mean, this is what I feel like, you know, some of the teachings from like the older, I guess yeah. the older in days, like the interpretations they have, it's all about, you know, or you, you want to, how, how not good this is, you know, if you kind of want to just like get rid of it, but it's not, now, like, so like for me, I think New Year's, I really struggled with it, yeah. but now I feel like that's not the case, it's just like, it's not like these things are, bad, you want to suppress, you want to yeah. get rid of it. Yeah. It's 
more about just understanding they're there and kind of it's about understanding they're there. They're there, you kind of yeah. raise them as part yeah. of you too. Yeah. So I almost feel like it's not, not saying that the this is what Buddha said, but I just think that the interpretations because these are the talks, you know, given back in the day in Indian culture. Yeah. yeah. Things are like, you know, super yeah. rigid and yeah. Yeah. that woman you know, it's like, can yeah. you take classes? But I think in today, would, would you, do you, do you think, do you think this is a valid point? Do I think? Do you think it, this is a valid point? I do, th I have to say that I do feel that, like these texts are coming very much from the Indian ascetic culture. But I do think that there are certain uh -huh. s stable principles which hold through, okay. through or valid principles which hold through all time, but maybe the way these are expressed and the way one deals with them in the suttas is very much conditioned by the Indian culture and particularly the Indian ascetic culture of that period. Like I would say, you know, for those of us who become take up the monastic life, then we have to follow <laughs> to succeed in following it. We have to be able to deal with the sensual lust in this way. Mm -hmm. But I would say that you know, rather than taking an attitude of avert, sort of fearful and apprehensive aversion towards these emotions, mm -hmm. one has to relate to them sort of softly and gently to recognize them, even if you want to say embrace them, mm -hmm. but as monastics not to act upon them, mm -hmm. but to, to look into them and to see them and to see how they operate. And it seems to me that the Mahayana Sutras maybe are transposing principles from early Buddhism into a later historical period to make them more adaptable to, say, the Indian culture several in the post Ashokan period, you know, second century, first century BC, whereas the Pali Sutras are coming out from the fifth century BC. Okay, if there are no further questions, then we move on to the next section. The next verse. Okay, so this is, this verse, the theme of this verse is craving and the cutting off of craving. So first we'll read the Pali text, then look at the related text. Yo tan ham uda chi da asay san. Yo tan ham uda chi da asay san. Sari tang siga saran. Be so saitva. Saritam siga saram. Be so saitva. Be so saitva. Be so saitva. So bhikkhu jahati o raparam. So bhikkhu jahati o raparam. Urago jinamiva. Urago jinamiva. Tachang Puranam. Tachang Puranam. Okay, and the translation is one who has entirely cut off craving, having dried up its fast flowing stream. That monk gives up the here and the beyond as a serpent sheds its old worn out skin. Okay, so as I mentioned before, raga, and which is rendered lust, and tanha, rendered craving, are very closely associated. But when the Buddha is expounding the Four Noble Truths, what he specifically singles out as the Noble Truth of the origin of dukkha, of suffering, is 
craving. And so in the Sutta on the Four Noble Truths, this is what we have. So the Buddha says, what, monks, is the noble truth of suffering? It is this craving which is productive of repeated existence. And I'll come back and explain that. Accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delight here and there. That is sensual craving, craving for existence, and craving for annihilation. Okay, the word that is translated as craving, the Pali word, tanha, is closely related to the English word thirst. And you could actually see this more clearly from the Sanskrit. You can see Krishna, which sometimes in Pali, Tanha, becomes Tasina. You see, two ways to turn Trishna into Pali is either Tanha or Tasina. And through Tasina you can see more clearly the connection with thirst. Okay, so we render it craving, and then it's said to be productive of renewed existence. The word here is Pono Bhavika where the word pono indicates literally it's again or repeated and then bhavika is an adjective based on bhava so bhava it's a state of individual existence and repeated existence means going through individual existence again and again from birth or conception through the whole life process, ending in death, followed by new conception, birth, development, aging, and death. And what keeps us, well, what drives us through that cycle again and again is this craving. And then craving is said to be accompanied by delight and lust. Nandi Raga Sahagata. So we can take delight and lust to be actually two aspects of craving. The lust is the desire for what one doesn't have, the desire to acquire and to accumulate more and more. And then the delight, Nandi, is enjoying that which one obtains. And then through that enjoyment of what one gets, through that indulgence in what one acquires, then the craving becomes reinforced, so it arises again <coughs> with more strength. <coughs> and then it's the nature of craving, or of the nature of a mind which is obsessed by craving, never really to be able to settle down with satisfaction. And so it's always seeking delight here and there. Tatra tatra abhinandani. Always looking here for pleasure. Ah, something nice to eat. Oh, now I'm full. Let me watch a ball game on the television. Oh, now I enjoy that. Now I'm getting a little drowsy. Let me take a nap. Let me go out and play cards with my friends. Or let me go shopping. So always seeking delight here and there. Okay, then the text enumerates three kinds of craving. So the sensual craving is craving for the objects of the senses through each of the sense doors. Then, more fundamental than that, 
is the craving for existence, the craving, the attachment to our existence and the drive to go on existing, backed by the idea that I have some kind of substantial self, some kind of solid identity that will go on existing. And it's that craving for existence, this is the most fundamental craving that drives that process of repeated existence. And then the last kind of craving, the third kind of craving, is craving for annihilation. And it would seem, I mean, superficially, this is what I thought when I first encountered Buddhism many, many years ago, that this is the kind of craving that might drive a person to commit suicide. But the texts don't explain it this, that way, but rather they explain it as craving accompanied by the view of annihilation craving as accompanied by the view. Actually, here we have the analysis of the craving. So let we can look at these three definite at these definitions of the three kinds of cravings. Okay, so what are the three kinds of cravings? Sensual craving, craving for existence, and craving for annihilation. seems in editing this I must have taken out the cra sensual craving by oversight. So I would say that sensual craving is craving for forms, sounds, odors, tastes, tactile objects, mental objects. Okay, then what is craving for existence? It's the lust, attachment, mental attachment associated with the view of existence. This is the view that I have some kind of substantial self, some kind of solid identity which will go on existing from life to life. And that kind of the craving associated with that view is craving for existence. Okay, then what is the craving for annihilation? It's the lust attachment, mental attachment associated with the annihilation view. The annihilation view is the view that at death we are completely annihilated and nothing survives beyond death. Oh, here then it says the remaining craving is sensual craving. Okay, then there's another definition of the threefold cravings, the three kinds of craving. So what is sensual craving? It's the lust, attachment, mental attachment associated with the sense sphere. Or now I would translate this, the desire realm. If you remember of the three realms of existence that I mentioned last night. So this is the craving to come back into the desire realm, to be reborn, maybe back as a human being or as a deva, a deity in the heavenly realms. Okay, then the lust, attachment, mental attachment associated with the form sphere and the formless sphere. The attachment that leads one to rebirth in the form realm and the formless realm. I don't agree with this. <laughs> that is the craving I think actually I miss, that should be the craving for existence. I must have missed copy. So that is the craving for existence. So craving to be, exist in the form realm and the formless realm. And then the lust attachment, mental attachment associated with the annihilation of you. That is the craving for annihilation. And then I took some texts which show how craving functions as the origin of suffering. So this is a text in a passage on dependent origination. So here the, the text says, in dependence on the I and visible forms, I consciousness arises. 
So consciousness arises, taking the I as its base, being aware of a knowing forms through the I. Then the meeting of these three, I forms and consciousness, that is called contact. Then with, condi with contact as condition, feeling arises, pleasant, painful, neutral feeling. And then with feeling as condition, especially or most um, decisively with pleasant feeling as, a, as condition, there arises craving. But if painful feeling arises, can craving arise? How? Refer to any. Yeah, you say the craving for the painful feeling to arise, or another slant on this. Not yet. I'm in a state of pain. Okay, true. I want to get the. I want the pain to go away. But how do I get the pain to go away? At least, in a general sense. By moving. What is that? It's like by moving potentially or changing something like design meditation. They're covering it up with the pleasure. Yeah. 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 One seeks in order to get rid of the pain. One seeks pleasure. Yeah. yeah so I'm feeling. moving today, so you know, I might go out to the bar and then meet some stimulating, exciting people, <laughs> and a pleasant feeling arises. Or, the abbot told me I can't go on arms round today, <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm feeling angry and upset. And so, I'll slip out of the monastery through the back door after lunch and go to that house and <laughs> say, did I leave my um, sitting cloth here the other day? <laughs> okay, so with feeling as condition, and then with the neutral, what's called the neutral feeling, it can be a sort of quiet, peaceful feeling. So if it's a quiet, peaceful, neutral feeling, it can still arise a subtle craving for that peaceful feeling. But if it's a dull, quiet, neutral feeling, then again I try to break out of it by seeking pleasure. Okay, and then the same thing is said to occur through each of the other sense organs and their objects. Okay, then here is a sutta which explains, uh, again from a different angle, how craving arises and becomes the origin of suffering. Okay, when one dwells contemplating gratification or looking for enjoyment in objects that can be clung to, craving increases. Then with craving as condition, there is clinging arises. Clinging is a kind of strengthening of craving, a strong craving, by which one grasps and holds to the objects that one has craved. Then with clinging as condition, existence occurs, since one is clinging, that clinging impels one into a new existence, then that new existence <coughs> begins with birth, and then as a consequence of birth, there is old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair. So that's the origin of this whole mass of suffering. And then the Buddha compares this to the case where there's a great bonfire burning, burning many loads of wood, and then from time to time a man would throw more fuel upon it, grass, cow dung, dry wood, and so Sustained by that fuel, the bonfire will continue burning for a long time.
Okay, then there is a sutta which explains how craving is the, together with ignorance, is the underlying root of the beginningless samsara, the beginningless course of birth and death. So the text says that this samsara is without any discoverable beginning. A first point cannot be seen of beings roaming and wandering, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. And then to sort of drive home the unsatisfactory nature of samsara, the Buddha says that the stream of tears that we've shed as we've roamed and wandered through this long course of samsara, weeping and wailing because of being united with the disagreeable, separated from the agreeable. This is more than the water in the four great oceans. So he says, for a long time, or many times over, again and again, we've experienced the death of our mother, goes on the death of one's father, the death of one's brothers, sisters, sons and daughters. And as you've experienced this weeping and wailing, the stream of tears that you have shed is more than the water in the four great oceans. Okay, then the remedy, at least one of the remedies for craving, is the perception of death or the recollection of death. So the Buddha says that the perception of death when developed and cultivated is of great fruit and benefit. It leads to the deathless. So by bringing to mind the inevitability of death, if we cultivate that perception, it leads deeper and deeper towards the deathless and culminates in the deathless in Nibbana. And so then the text says, when a, my, when a monk, off, or anybody, we should say, often entertains the perception of death, his mind shrinks away from this attachment to life, this craving for existence, turns back from it, rolls away from it, and is not drawn towards it and then either equanimity or revulsion is established in them. Again, this is illustrated by the feather or a strip of sinew thrown into a fire. But the ultimate, since craving, according to the Buddha, ultimately stems from ignorance, so the ultimate way to eliminate craving is through wisdom or insight, but sort of a temporary way to help craving to subside is to do this recollection of death, of our mortality. Then when we realize that I, can, I have to die, I'm bound to die, that death can take place at any time, I don't know when, even later today, tomorrow, and that when death occurs, I have to leave everything behind, then that craving starts to shake in its boots, so to speak, and to subside until it settles down. Okay, maybe we could take, before the break for the work period, we could take a few minutes of questions. Fine, yes, Will? Um, besides the five recollections or the five remembrances, how else can you recollect Madhanayusi or mindfulness of death? Besides the five recollections? Yeah, or the five remembrances where you uh, like focus on you're going to grow old, you're going to become sick, you're going to die, everyone and everything you love is going to be separated from you. And then oh, I see, I see, those five recollections. Okay, I actually have like a somewhat detailed way of explaining the recollection of death. I'm going to do this at the Tuangyan Monastery on four, Saturday, four successive Saturdays in August. So the fourth one will be the, the recollection of death. But I'll just do it very, very quickly here. Okay, what I do is to take <coughs> for death three main themes, each to be broken down into three aspects. 
Okay, the first main theme is that death is inevitable, that I can't escape death. And then the way this is taken from three angles, one is that I recollect that everyone who has ever lived in the past has died, you know, no matter how powerful, famous, rich they might have been, great conquerors, even great saints, even the Buddha, the great Arahats, have died. And so when that's the case, I'm not going to be the exception. <laughs> Death is not going to say, okay, I get everybody else, but Bhante, we really like you around here. <laughs> you know, it used to be like, in Sri Lanka, at the hospital, when we have to go to the hospital for some reason, it's like a long, long line, but when the medical attendant see the monk comes onto the line, they'll say, because it's a Buddhist country, so it's a tradition to give priority to monks, so they say, okay, you come, and you come up to the front. <laughs> but with death, there's no, no, <laughs> I can't say, I'm a monk, I'm a monk. <laughs> You skip over me, uh, there are other people around. <laughs> okay, so death is absolutely inevitable because everybody else in the past has died, so I also am no exception. Second aspect here of death is inevitable. From the very moment that I was born, death has also come along with me. So in a sense, like, death is right here with me, it's sort of like, always just behind there, just uh, the verse says, it's like a murderer with a drawn sword, <laughs> a little scary, waiting for the opportunity to strike. So when conditions appear, then death occurs. Okay, so that's the second aspect. Third aspect is that just like the sun, when it rises, it's always moving even imperceptibly towards the setting. So once birth takes place, I'm always moving day, year by year, hour by hour, or actually year by year, month by month, day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second, split second by split second, always moving closer to death. So that's three aspects of death is inevitable. The second main theme is that the arrival of death is absolutely uncertain, unpredictable. So, it's unpredictable in regard to time. So, I can't say, or somebody who's 16 years old can say, I'm 16, I have 70 more years ahead of me. So, we don't, you know, even somebody who's just born, well, they, Somebody who's just born doesn't say, doesn't speak. But we can say somebody who's just born, they have a full life ahead of them. Death can come at any time. Infants, teenagers, young people, middle age, old age. So the time is unpredictable, the place is unpredictable. We don't know exactly where we will be. The cause is unpredictable. So unpredictable in those three respects. Then the third main theme is that when death occurs, I have to give up everything. So I have to give up all material possessions. I have to give up, so that's the first. The second, I have to give up everyone who is dear and beloved to myself. And then the third is I have to give up even this body. I want to know also, I like to contemplate that during walking meditation. Yeah. But I want to know, um, is, are we supposed to like repeat this rigidly or is it supposed to be like uh, we have it as a theme that envelops our mind and then if we ever kind of go astray then we come back to like this overall structure? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I would do it as, I mean I do it like as a reflective meditation, not 
the first one he said just repeating? Yeah, not, I don't do that either. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's a kind of reflection. And even one could sort of, if your mind moves in that direction, to elaborate in your own ways. You know, you don't have to stick to this writ to the scheme rigidly. Right. I just find it as a useful template. Thank you. Okay, somebody else. Sir? Um. Yeah. Your name? I didn't. Dragor. Excuse me. Dragor. Dragor. Yeah. Um, with the arising of craving um, for sexual desire, it's very. It, it's the hot. The heat is very clear. It's clear in yeah. the moment. Yeah. That is painful. Yeah. But I've noticed that with uh, like. The craving for affection from a cat, say, <laughs> my my cat on my lap, like I, it's it's stickier, yeah. like it's it's gentling and it feels like yeah. there's a definite clinging there, yeah. but it's comforting and it's harder to see. Yeah. It's yeah. not as it's not like sexual attraction where it tends up, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. I can see the, in the desire to the moment. It's like more. It's, um, Okay. It's more insidious and except in its absence, like if I hurt my cat's feelings or my cat yeah. is missing, yeah. it's harder to perceive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I say, I mean, in everyday life, one should show some affection to the cat. If you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I say that there are relatively in innocent types of affection, and particularly what's being laid out here, or what I've been laying out on the basis of these texts, is the path for a renunciant who is seeking the final goal. Now, for, le for lay people living in you know, the life of the world, the Buddha doesn't say, cut off all affection, attachment, and strive with, strive diligently and heedfully for the final goal, but he speaks when speaking to married people, how the husband should show affection and take care of his wife, how the wife should show affection and take care of the husband, how parents should look after their children, children after their parents. You know, so his teaching is all sort of directed towards people in their everyday situations. And I think it's a mistake, though I'm giving this presentation from a monastic point of view, for lay people to take the monastic mod, or the monastic uh, template as their own model for practice. If they want to do that, then one should become ordained. <laughs> well, I'm not going to stop petting my cat. No, don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's something that I've noticed recently. Cause yeah. It does, at, at moments yeah. I am aware of it, it yeah. does actually cause suffering. Yeah. And as far as my my clingings and sensual, yeah. sensual yeah. cravings. Yeah. Actually, my, my obsession with my cat, my girlfriend's, our obsession with our cat is actually fairly high up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I said, recognize, recognize the clinging, but don't um, feel that it's something that you have to cut off at once. You should consult with the cat. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can take one more question, and then I think we have to break for the work period. Uh, Margaret, is that correct? Um, do you have any suggestions for meditations to work on extinguishing mental craving? Craving for like, fab mental fabrication? Okay, yeah, for mental fabrications. Probably the most effective... Well, actually, there are a number of approaches that can be taken for that. Sort of the classical subject for that is the mindfulness of breathing. But what happens, I mean, I, I know that when one is intending to be mindful of the breath, often that mindfulness of the breath function, or the attempt to be mindful of the breath, functions somewhat as the screen, the background against which one could see the mental fabrications. So one and if the mental fabrications become so prominent that they prevent one from focusing on the breath, one method one could use to deal with them is sort of to put the breath aside and just focus on the mind itself and watch the mind itself. Even what I found useful in situations like that is to take the word mind, not as a mantra, but 
as I said, tuning device to look into the mind and just use the word mind or mind is ever changing and just observe the mind mind, mind, mind or mind is always changing observing the mind just the way a cat might be observing a mouse hole <laughs> you know, with the expectation that the mice might come out now what one finds, or might find, is that when one is observing the mind, the mental activities start to loosen up and to subside until one is wondering, where is my mind? <laughs> what is it doing? It's not doing anything. <laughs> because it's when you're observing, then the mental activities don't have the chance to sort of operate behind your back, so to speak. Okay, we're into the period now where we should be doing the preparations, I think. So we'll stop for the morning, pause for the morning, and then resume.